Salute to Knicks Nation. The Knicks season is just around the corner. The fall season is here. And just like that, it is hoodie season. So head on over to shop.knicksfantv.com and get your hoodies today. From the classic KFTV logo hoodie to the For the Fans, By the Fans hoodie to the New York versus the World hoodie. We got something for everybody. Go to shop.nixfantv.com. Use our code HOOD for 15% off your purchase. It was the right move to make him the captain because you're going to feed. You, you're going to, you're, you know, your team is going to go as only as far as your captain and your leader. Him being as, as level-headed as you are is going to have a whole locker room level-headed. Well, the goal is to win a championship. The goal is not to play well. You know, the goal is to win a championship, and, uh, they, and we on our way with Jalen at the head. You didn't get to go to any Philly games, did you? I did. I went to game four. When Man, the Knicks took, took, over. Over. took over. You in Philly, you yeah, can't do yeah, that. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at social media. I'm saying, yo, Knicks, y'all can't do that. Yeah. Fans took over Philadelphia. Over, the right first up. game I scored four, and everybody jumped in my ear. Man, it, it's not going to happen with you. And the next game, I had 21, 22 points, and we won the next game. So I, did, I knew then you're going to have to play a pivotal role in, in, in us getting to where we need to get to. All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation. CP the Franchise here. Number one show for the fans, by the fans. And we got a special edition of Knicks Fan TV in studio. He was the number one pick in the 1991 NBA draft. The NBA's Rookie of the Year in the 91-92 season. A member of the NBA's All-Rookie Team that year. A member of the All-NBA Team a two-time All-Star, and most notably spent five seasons with our New York Knicks. We got the incomparable Larry Johnson in the building. LJ, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. Appreciate you having me on. Man, it's been an honor to have you on. It is an honor to have you on, man. It's been a long time coming. You were one of those Knicks that I idolized as a kid growing up in the 90s, man. So it's an honor to have you in here in person to, to chop it up on Orange that. and Thank Blue, man. You. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. So so let's get into today's team because the fan base is hyped right now. October 22nd between the Knicks and the Celtics cannot come soon enough, especially after last year and the growth of this team. And we, we got to start with Jalen Brunson at number 11, man. You've been through this organization. You see them as a kid all the way up as a man. Just talk about the, the last two years and, and the growth and development that you've seen from Jalen Brunson. Man, I, you know, I'm from originally from Dallas, Texas. And uh, not not a big, huge uh, Mavericks fan, but I thought, you know, Mavericks has a pretty good organization. And I can't understand for the life of me why they let the young man go. I mean, I just like, wow, that's that was not just a great move. But we it was great for us, luck, great to have him. And like you like you mentioned, I've seen Jalen from when he was a youngster running around with his father in the locker room to now, to even the, the, the two championships he won at Villanova. So mad respect, always loved him. And for him to be doing what he's doing now in this city, in the world's most famous arena, you know, I just, I, I give him all the respect, man, and love, and uh, just hope he just continue this. Uh, he's a born leader. You know, he was named captain not too long ago. I thought that was just a great move and the right move for the Knicks to make sure that it, it's just put out there that, you know, Jalen, you, you, you're our captain. We need you to do, uh, to, to lead this team. and. And he was born to do it, so I think he's got. He did it at he did it at every level. So of course, um, uh, Nova, he got his boys with him now, so he's comfortable. And uh, I, like you said, I just can't wait for the season to start. You, you mentioned him doing it in this town, and you played through this town. You played with Patrick, and you you know what that feels like from a pressure standpoint. I always said that when he got here in the first year, when he was very impressive, I almost felt like his poise was almost as impressive mm -hmm. as his skill on the court. Has to be. Has to be again. I, 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 that's why I say um, um, it was the right move to make him the captain because you're going to feed. You, you're going to you know your team is going to go as only as far as your captain and your leader. And his poise, it, him being as as level headed as he are is going to have a whole locker room level headed. Everybody, if you just take this guy's key and, and just look at him for direction, then you know I hold the whole year should be just as level like last year. Uh, we would have did way much better, as everybody know, and Knicks, Knicks uh, fans know. We hit, got hit with the, with the injury uh, bug, but that's that's a part of sports. That's going to happen. So, but if we have a leader that can keep us on pace and keep everybody at level key, and and, and no, and don't forget the goal. The goal is to win a championship. Yeah. Goal is not to play well. You know, the goal is to win a championship, and uh, they, and we on our way with Jalen at the head. 
with a leadership like his, does it remind you of any point guards that you played with in the past? Well, all my point guards, uh, you know, I, I I get the question all the time, who was your favorite teammate, favorite teammate? That's a hard question because yeah. I loved I only played for two uh, right. NBA teams. Yeah. But I loved all my teammates. I never had a bad teammate. And uh, But I always would say, when they ask me my favorite teammate, I'm always going to name a point guard because that's who's responsible for getting you the ball. Yeah. And Muggsy come to mind. You know, uh, when I was here, we had uh, Charlie Ward. You mentioned Charlie earlier, and we had Chris Child, mm. who was leaders too. But Patrick was just like our, our, our cornerstone. So Patrick was the leader and the captain of our team. And 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 uh, like I said, our two point guards did exactly what they were supposed to do. But when I was at Charlotte, uh, it was Muggsy in the locker room, Muggsy on the floor, Muggsy in command of the uh, the whole game. So that reminds me of like Jalen. The on-court skill set, what's been the most impressive for you when it comes to Brunson? That little left hand. Man, left hand is always awkward. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, left hand always awkward. But yeah. the way he gets to the basket and how he's crafty around the basket. I mean, plenty, plenty of times, you know, I, uh, myself, John Starks, uh, the Knicks did a great job of bringing the uh, veterans back or, and you bringing retired players back. And sitting on the front row, to see him maneuver but with, with six, eight, six, nine, seven footers and get that shot off around the basket, it is impressive. It is impressive because you can see him there and he's doing all these little great footwork down there, yeah, great yeah. footwork down there. And, and, and just a little angle, I'm like, oh, that's block. No, that's a bucket. No, that's a bucket with 6'10 and six guys die. So the way he gets to the basket and get that little shot off is, is impressive. You mentioned, the, I called it the Legends Lounge, when they had all you the guys Legends down Lounge. there during like the playoffs because I was at a lot of those home games, and I thought that was a great touch by the Knicks at Madison Square Garden, putting all you guys together and then featuring you guys with mm -hmm. the crowd, especially when Patrick came back. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just brought all the nostalgia back for me and then played right into the intensity on the court because it felt like the 90s mm -hmm. were back, man. Mm -hmm. I, I think that this team here and uh, the team before, and Thibodeau, most of us played with Thibodeau as assistant coach when he was there. He was, uh, of course, assistant coach my five years here. But it, I think bringing everybody back, it was a great touch. And you can tell that um, uh, the veterans, and I mean, I say veterans, the retired players is really into this team. They play hard. Uh, they all have to play for each other. They play for Tib and they play in defense. Exactly now with, the, with, with what we got now, it's going to be a defensive team. So... Uh, we can see ourselves in these guys is by with the way they play. Um, they probably a little better, a little talented than we were. I mean, we had Patrick who was one of the top 50th player of all time. So I think that may have, you know, uh, put us right there. But as far as talent across the board and defense across the board, we, that remind me of the team I played on and even just a little bit better. You mentioned Tibbs, and one of the offseason moves the Knicks made was signing him to a contract extension. And you were with then assistant coach Tom Thibodeau mm -hmm. in your playing days with the Knicks. What about his growth and maturation as a head coach? Because, I mean, you look at it, at, you pull the, the curtain back. Playoffs three out of the last four years. I think he's he's fifth all-time in wins already. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's been he's built Didn't an impressive that. resume Didn't since he's been here. No, this is a great move. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm a little biased because of Tip, you know, sure. when I was there and loved Tip. He was my shooting coach. Everybody had like a shooting coach on the team and mm -hmm. Tip was my shooting coach and he's old school. You know, I think he did have to do some adjusting to these young players and with, what is it called, loading, uh, oh, uh, man, all this old <laughs> stuff. You know, Tip don't go for that, man. Yeah, he, yeah. You know, but uh, I think he's done a great job of adjusting to uh, the way the NBA is now and putting his little stamp on it. And I think those guys understand, you know, Tib is a communicator. So what he wants, he is not. Is, you're not going to be thinking about what Tib wants. He's going to let you know exactly what he wants out of you as a player. So uh, uh, big ups to Tib, and I think he deserves his, his contract. Straight shooter, man. Yeah. Uh, the Knicks made a blockbuster trade this summer for Macau Bridges. Mm -hmm. You're adding him to OG Ananobi in that wing duo. Mm -hmm. well, what are your expectations for Macau this uh, this season? Well, um, I mean, uh, he, he did a great job at Brooklyn. He's done a great job since he's been in the league. And his defensive uh, intensity on the defense, he's long, he's wiry. Uh, it gives you another another uh, a wing player to play against the guys in, in the Boston, uh, you know, the, you know uh, guys in Indiana. So uh, it was a great addition. Uh, and but then, you know, you're back with your, your Nova guys. I mean, I won a championship in college a long time ago. Wish I had a, a chance to play with some of the guys that was, uh, you know, it's a, you know, you almost can close your eyes and know where a guy is. I mean, it, it sounds like a small thing, but it's really not. It's really not. And we get our other guys, get around doing our other guys, it's just Robinson to, uh, you know, get on the same page with these guys, then uh, the sky's the limit, I believe.
And, and mentioning Julius, the Knicks have another all-star who can mm -hmm. play outside of Jalen Brunson, uh, but he was beset by a tough shoulder injury last year, and they didn't really have him, especially in the playoffs when I thought they really needed him. They really needed another dynamo yeah. that could help bend that defense and create for others. How what's, what's your advice to him in terms of just getting back into the flow with these guys and just leading this team to, to meet their expectations? Well, you mentioned the shoulder injury, injury. It looked real bad when we was there. I think I was on the front row. And uh, the, the main thing is just make sure you're healthy. Make sure you're healthy. Make sure your health is there because you, you, and then you can come. He was having a great year. He was having a great year. And if he's healthy and he comes back, Jalen and the rest of the squad, they all respect him. Tib knows what Tib respect him. And we'll be able to put him in a position to make sure, you know, uh, uh, you can be, be more successful for yourself and the team. So he's an all-star. He's a veteran now. And um, – I just, I, with Jalen being like the captain and this, and I think that, and being in his ear, and they, them two, I'm, from what I've seen, you know, I'm not in the locker room. They have a great rapport as far as teammates, a big man, a point guard, great rapport. So if we can just keep that up, I think the sky's the limit for Julius, even MVP for Julius. And I would like to see even more of a two-man connection between those guys on the court because what was noticeable when Julius was going was that in Jalen, mm -hmm. we didn't have another guy who could set him up and get easy buckets. I mean, I think the stat was he shot like 70% effective field goal percentage on on um, uh, on a shooting, on, on catching Jalen did? Jalen. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying if you have Julius Randle out there who can help spread that ball around mm -hmm. and it gets back to Jalen who can – get it off the catch. I think that makes him even more formidable. Well, both of those guys demand attention on defensive end. Like when Jalen get to driving, and even when Jalen try to, you know, post sometime with the footwork, he demands attention, a double team, and the same with Julius. So with that combination, and then we get some shooters around, I mean, they're going to be hard to stop on the offensive end. Speaking of shooting, Dante DiVincenzo goes back to the bench, and I'm sitting there like, I think that's ideal, but they can't forget about him, man. Absolutely not. He made 238 three-pointers last year. I thought he was the second-best three-pointer behind Steph Curry. Probably the best shooting season by a Nick. They can't forget about him in his three-point Absolutely rounds. not. He came into his own, I mean, with the injury prone to what happened. He just played his butt off, man. He played his butt off. He was one of the main keys to them guys going as far as they did as we doing as well as we did. So uh, I, I don't think the, the fans won't let nobody forget about DiVincenzo. We won't. And uh, Tib won't do that. And, and again, you know, and I don't. We, I'm not gonna throw that out there, but you're gonna always get your chance to come out and shine. And he did what he needed to do last year to make sure that he get playing time this year. Who, who's the guy in the roster who you look at and say, "Man, I, I would have loved to have played with him," or, or reminds you of that '90s style? Man, what what Josh Hart did, man, was unreal. Now, of course, you know you got to your, your Jalen's and your and, and 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 Julius and all that, but I'm I'm, I'm on the front row. Why Josh not a big dude? That's not a big dude, but the effort he was giving, man, it reminds you of like a, I, I, I don't know, what's Josh, 6'6", 6'5", 6'6"? Yeah. That reminds me of a 6'5", 6'6", six, 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 uh, uh, Dennis, Dennis Rodman, man. Just going after everything, just the intensity. And not. And, and then when you have a guy like that and who who's going to sacrifice for the team and say that, you don't got to run a play for me, coach. You don't have to run a play. I get mine off tip-ins, off offensive rebound, running the floor. I get mine that way. So... Yeah, with Josh Hart's there, I wish he would have. I, I wouldn't mind playing with him. His ability to adapt was incredible for this team and their success going into the playoffs last year. I mean, there was a stat, I believe it was rebounds between six to ten feet, and there was a bunch of centers on the list, and that Josh Hart. And heard, Josh Hart, right, 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 right in the That's mix. what I'm saying. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, he's not just one of the best rebounding guards; he's one of the best rebounders in the, in the league. league. Yeah, absolutely. In the entire league, and then you know when Julius Step was left with the injury, I thought it was key for Josh Hart to be that guy who could. Just generate offense for the team, maintain his rebounding. And then on top of that in the playoffs, he shot about 37% from three. So he was knocking them down, knocking down the open shots. They really needed that. I mean, that's not his forte, but he can definitely knock down, especially like I, we was talking about Ju Julius getting back and then uh, 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 um, um, Mitch. Mitch getting mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. and then uh, de demanding double teams, mm -hmm. demanding double teams. Josh got to knock that shot down. This team has been transformed really under Leon Rose's leadership. From your vantage point, being with the organization day in and day out, how, how have you seen that, that leadership from, from the Rose regime? Well, I don't know him uh, too much, but I just, I know he used to be an agent to some of these guys and he knows these guys personally. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's big. That's big for guys when you know your management and all that have really have your best back and your best interest in heart. So, 
Um, there's really, um, as far as the guys we have here, man, I think it's just set up for them to just be successful because, um, you know, um, everybody plays for each other. I think they all genuinely like Thibodeau. Mm -hmm. And then again, like I said, like you said, uh, Rose uh, putting together what he put together and then these guys really genuinely knowing that he has their back, their best interest in heart. So this is about life too, man. You know what I'm saying? These yeah. guys got a um, uh, life after basketball and life off the court. So if you can just really uh, get everybody to buy into one, you know, one goal, one theme, then that's when you get success. That's when you have success in this league. Boston won the championship last year, but the East is retooling. Philadelphia made a ton of moves to try to build a championship team around Maxi and Embiid. You have Indiana there. You have Orlando, Cleveland. Who outside of Boston? Do you think outside of the Knicks and Boston? Right. Is, is, if you were just going to say Boston, I was going to say us. Oh, absolutely. If we can stay I'm healthy. Us but, right there. Yeah. Who's that next team that you think that the Knicks need to be on guard for? Philly. Philly. I mean, Abib is always, uh, uh, you know, and he, he he demands his. He demands his. So, you know, uh, MVP candidate, and he can always go off and win it. So, and Abib, I mean, uh, 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 Max is a, a down home. Well, I'm from the Dallas, Texas area. Yeah. I played high school ball against Maxie's father. I oh, know right. Tyrone. So, you know, I, I pulled for him. I hate to be on the front row <laughs> when I was going for my dicks. I just uh, wanted to say to him, tell your father what up. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I think what they, like you said, the additions they made this year uh, and this summer, and to go with those two guys, they're definitely going to be a, a force. Yeah. You know, it's interesting with Embiid. Uh, he's becoming the number one villain now to, to the Knicks yeah, fans. Yeah. Yeah. And based on some of his tactics and some of the theatrics during the playoffs, yeah. but it's almost like some of that 90s stuff kind of that he kind of incorporates into his game. What do, you, what do you think about that? I'm going to tell you what I think. I was so shocked, man. Just I'm going to get over it. But yeah. did you, did, when we played him in the playoffs, did you you didn't get to go to any Philly games, did you? I did. I went to game four. When man, the fans Knicks took, took over. over. Took you over. in Philly. You yeah. can't do yeah. that. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at social media. I'm saying, yo, Knicks, y'all can't do that. Yeah. Fans took over Philadelphia. Over. Man, that was crazy. If it was football, it would be a different story. Yeah. Now, they football, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the yeah. Eagles is a different crowd. No, but no question. I, I, and, and, and having a B, I mean, he wasn't 100%. He won 100%. So Max had a lot on his shoulder. So, um, you know, they, the Knicks played a great, had to play a great, great, great series against those guys and pulled it off. But I just, I mean, some of his tactics, man, and he's, he's never been to me a dirty player. Yeah. But just some of the things he did in the playoffs against us, it shocked me. Yeah. I mean, I think he was, he was hampered by his little injury. So I think he was just doing anything. That's a will to win. That's just a will to win. I ain't going to hold it against him. That's a will to win. And again, like you said, in the 90s, we tried to do everything we did to, to, to win a box basketball game. By any means necessary, right. for sure, man. If you put Prime LJ on this Knicks roster, mm. what, would he, what would he bring to this team? Oh, man. Uh, especially, I mean, look, I'll be, I'm going to be embarrassed if I don't play as hard as Josh. If I don't play with being taller than Josh and, uh, and, and, you know, a little bigger than Josh, I'm like, okay. And then knowing you got to get playing time on this team. And in order for me to get playing time, I'm going to have to put that effort in. Mm -hmm. But also, I, I would definitely bring another uh, um, um, act scoring on the box. I mean, again, we have uh, Julius that can get down there and get it in. But I'm like, hey, man, uh, let me get four or five touches down here. And we need it. We get snacks stagnant on offense. Let me get a play down here, coach. I can get us some scoring down here. Some high efficiency points inside. Exactly. Sometimes this team is missing that. Yeah, sure. exactly. I mean, uh, you got to be – I mean, the whole NBA has gotten away from, uh, you know, big man on the box. But yeah. it's always an added great addition to have to go with your outside play, to go with your shooting. You know, everybody – you know, Steph – Steph done took over the league throwing up these threes like yeah. he do. And now we got seven footers that want to shoot threes. But, you know, to have an addition where you can throw it to somebody on the box and say, get me a basket when, you know, everything is not going well, that's a great addition to have. And when you speak about skill set, you know, Anthony Edwards came under fire just a couple weeks ago when he said that outside of Michael Jordan, there weren't any skilled players in the 90s. And I immediately thought about you, man. Anthony Young. Like, Anthony Young. Yeah, what'd you, you think know, about could, that? Well, he got skills. He got skills. He did his thing. But, you know, maybe he's the, you know, you know, it's shocking to me that, you know, you have these guys in the league now that um, really don't know their history. Really didn't really watch basketball back then. You know, uh, I think these guys are more athletic than we were. Mm -hmm. And we had way more skills than they did as mm -hmm. far as fundamentals Fun of playing match. the game. Yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And uh, you know, getting basket pick and roll. We we we, uh, and and Chicago with their three, uh, whatever that was, three cornered or whatever. And us with our just fundamental, we playing on offense. We were very sufficient. So 
you know, uh, you know, he just spoke out of turn. He just spoke out of turn. Somebody, whoever the head coach over there, need to set him down and show him some film. Yeah. Other than Jordan, right? You know, right. other than Jordan. So, yeah, I didn't think too much of him. When you were in the league in those early '90s, who who was who was the guy when you first came in as a rookie that really humbled you? Like, man, like, welcome to the NBA. Like, seeing a cupcake league. It was too many. It was too many. It was a lot. Uh, back then, man, if you, I mean, it's different. But back then, like, like, like Jalen went four years of college. Mm. Back then, it was you know Kobe did what he did, and um, uh, uh, Ken, uh, uh, Kevin. Uh, uh, yeah, Kevin Garnett did what he did coming out of high school. But back then, we went four years of college. So once you got in the NBA, you was kind of set as, as far as skill set, as far as passing the ball, dribbling the ball, your skill set, but just shooting the ball, you know. And um, you just had to learn the game. It was faster. Uh, it was stronger, much stronger. I was one too many guys in uh, college basketball stronger than me. I got an NBA. It's like, oh, I'm going to have to lift some weights. Mm. I'm going to have to lift some weights. But as far as... Uh, Guys that really put me in my place. I mean, I can't. I can't say Michael Jordan because I didn't guard him. Yeah, yeah, I didn't guard him. But at my at the point, I mean, at Power Four where I was at, uh, first time playing against Charles Barkley was a light. Uh, first time playing against, uh, and you know these are and these are regular names, yeah. but it's the truth. Yeah. First time playing against a guy named Carl Malone, like he's a mountain, right? You know what I'm saying? But for me. I was the number one pick, as you mentioned, 1991. Number one pick in 1990 was Derrick Coleman. Mm. So we couldn't wait. Me and, me and D.C. went at each other, and it was all cussing and going at each other. And to see someone 6'9", 6'10", and, and, and Anthony, you should look at this. To see somebody 6'9", 6'10", dribble, shoot, pass, do anything with the ball. Anything with the ball. I'm playing against D.C., and I'm waiting on him to come down to the box. He stopped 25 or whatever the uh, uh, three-pointer was and strokes it with the left. I'm like, oh, man, you got to guard this dude the whole way. Way. Yeah, so D.C., and then, like I said, it's the, the Barclays and the Carl Malones. Were those the guys that you looked at as your rivals? Like, when you saw those guys on your schedule, like, oh. I, Here I gotta, we go. Yeah, let's get, let's get eight hours of sleep there. Yeah, night. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And then Sean Campbell, you know, was no with no slouch. Yeah. And, um, you know, those were the guys. Uh, with, I played in the uh, Dream Team 2 with Sean mm -hmm. in D.C., so we got to know each other pretty good. But those were the guys, young, that they called us the young stars at that time. So you really wanted to to show against those guys. You really want you want to show every night. You want to show every night. 82 games is a, is a lot of games to go out and get your intensity up. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, those were the guys that was like my rivalry back then. When you were traded to the Knicks in, in 96, mm -hmm. What we what did you feel like you wanted to bring to the team at that time? That team had they have they were two years removed from the finals, disappointing the following year in that loss to Indiana. What what did you want to bring to that team in, in that ninety six season? Again, the low box scoring. Uh, and when I was tra so I was traded for Mace. Yeah. So and, and you know Mace was a heck of a player. Mace really didn't get his due. But again, Anthony, I was looking skills. Look yeah, at right, skills, right, man. Yeah. This dude's, what, 260, right, 70 right. pounds? Bring the ball up. Bring the ball up the yeah. court, man, fast as hell. You know, so, uh, but I thought scoring on the box again. You got Patrick. When I got Patrick was on the left, I was on the right. So uh, to, to be able to, uh, because if you look at the, when they lost to Houston, it was the scoring at the end. It was the scoring at that last seventh game where they got stagnated and really didn't have no one else other than Patrick. And then uh, John did not have a good game that game. So there was no scoring nowhere after that. So, uh, yeah, I just was like, uh, when we get like that, Jeff, you know you can throw it to me on the box and I'm going to get us something good. When you came to this team, you had the old guard. Ewing was still there. It was mm -hmm. still his team. You had Oakley, had mm -hmm. Starks. Mm -hmm. That same year, they signed Allen Houston as well. Mm -hmm. Did you feel what Chris was Charles. Chris Charles as well? Was there any learning curves or growing pains when you came in to kind of gel with those guys? It was for me. Uh, my, the way I, I looked at it was I wasn't going to be over. I mean, because it, in Charlotte, I got all, besides me and uh, 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 Lonzo Morning, you know, we was one and two. Mm, yeah. And I was getting, I went from, uh, getting 20, 25 shots a game to 10 and 12 shots a game. And I wasn't going to let, long as we was winning and it was doing the, the like the, the flow of the, I, I just wanted the team to flow. Mm -hmm. You know, if it, if, if, the, if, it was, if it was awkward, then I, I would have did something else. But if it was just doing the flow of the team and we were successful with it, that's what I wanted. So um, it took a little learning curve. It took a little learning curve and I had to take a step back and I didn't have no, no problem doing that long it was for the, the best best of the 
uh, for the team and for us to win, I had no problem with taking a step back. When I talked to Charlie Ward a few years ago, he when we talked about practice, you mentioned how Tibbs had to scale his practice back for these mm -hmm. guys. But well, Charlie Ward had mentioned how the 90s Knicks used to run a gauntlet, especially with the younger players where they had to run through and – you had the bigs and, and the other guards on, on each side of them, and you had to kind of run through, and these guys are throwing elbows, and Oakley's throwing elbows. Did, did you remember any of that, that during your time? Man, we always threw it. Our practice was different. Yeah, Our practice yeah. was different, and Jeff was different. I mean, to have these, you can't do it anymore. You know, we were talking earlier, the league, league has changed, but I, I, I can't remember a lot of stuff we did, man, but it was all physical. It was all filled. The East was back then. I mean, it's like you said, these uh, other teams is gearing up. So it's getting right back to that, talking about a B. But the East was all about physicality. It wasn't, the West was showtime. And over here, it was about uh, banging. So, yeah, we, had pro we practiced that a lot. What was the, because I, I, I talked to, to Mike Saunders just recently. And one of the things when I spoke to like Mike Saunders and, and Harper and those guys, especially in the, the early 90s with those Nick teams, was despite the fact that they won like 50 plus games each year and were always at the top of the East, there really wasn't much chemistry off the court with those guys. And when we talk about this current team and the Nova Knicks and there's so much chemistry and camaraderie, what was it like during, during your tenure, those five seasons with the, with, with the Knicks? No, we had chemistry. Again, my first year we brought in three critical, uh, to myself included. So it was mm -hmm. three uh, critical um, uh, uh, points on our team: myself, Chris, and, and Alla. So we all gelled because we was all three was new, um, and we didn't have we. Everybody on our team was for our team. Oakley and Patrick made sure of that. Oakley and Patrick made, you know, and Charlie Ward is a doctor born leader, you know, a, a Heisman Trophy winner at Florida State. So Charlie knew his role, and our chemistry was great. Our chemistry was great. Now, you mentioned uh, everybody going out to eat together after the game, that doesn't really make chemistry. That's, that's cool to do. Mm -hmm. But long as at practice and in the locker room, and on the floor, you all on the same page and everything. No, you don't have no big old eyes, you, you know, like on me, on me, on me. If you don't have that, then your chemistry is fine. So I, I, I thought our chemistry was great. Everybody got along. Um, we didn't have nobody mad at each other and nobody hollering. I, I'm not getting my shots. If you look at our comments in the papers after the game, it was never pointing the finger at nobody else. How did you handle, because on my platform, we hear from the fans after every night, you know, win or lose, whether they are on the high, whether they're on the low, this social media era is 24-7. Fan opinions, fan opinions, fan opinions. How did you handle that in your time? Like, if you got off to a slow start, if you had a bad game, how did you handle fan opposition? You, I, leaned, I leaned on my teammates, leaned on the coaching staff. You know, you got to go through it. Uh, I went through some of that, myself and uh, Alan, I believe. We went through a little of that at the beginning of the year. Um, because, you know, Allen left, was coming from Detroit. Detroit with 20 points a game, and I was coming from uh, Charlotte with 20 points a game. Now, you know, you look up and you have uh, 12 or 14 points, three or four games in a row. So, you know, uh, fans, yo, what's wrong with this guy? What's wrong with this guy? <laughs> well, I'm not getting tw uh, 20 times a game, man. So uh, we went through that a little bit, but the way I handled it, it was um, – Stayed in Jeff's ear. ear J, uh, 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 Jeff stayed in my ear. Tib stayed in my ear. The t team they stayed in my ear. And, and and then when you when you do do your interview after the game, it, it makes it more more uh, easier if you win, mm. and you can just talk about winning. And, and and you know you had these you know you know we had a love and hate relationship with 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 uh sure. with uh the media. Sure. But, you know dude, some of them guys switch you, some of them guys not with you. So yeah. you can sit and win a fifth game by 10, 15 points and then hit the question of, well, you only had 10 points tonight. <laughs> you know, come on, man, we won the game. <laughs> right, so you right. lean on that. What was it hard to avoid the papers and the sports radio back? Then? You couldn't. You could not. Wow. And I, I, I mean, I feel for these guys because it's more social media now, right? Right. Yeah. It's just more more platform for them now, right? But we just had, we just had New York um, of, um, press. And boy, they could be brutal. If they didn't like you, they did not like you. If you can get you, if one of the guys from one paper just didn't like you, you can have one of the best games of the year. And the, the, his article the next day might be, well, he he, he didn't sign his fans, or he, he shook this little guy's autograph after the game, you know. So, yeah, you, there's no getting around it. There's no getting around it. But if you put your head down and do your job and play hard, the, the fans will respect you more. Yeah. 
the rivalries is, is what really got me to, to love the Knicks, starting with the, the rivalries with Jordan, the rivalries with Indiana, but the Heat ones, that was personal, man. I, I saw it was personal for you guys. I had a cousin who was living down in Miami at the time. He was all Miami Heat, so we would go at it. I felt that as a fan, when you were getting geared up for those guys, whether it was regular season or the four consecutive playoff series, was it was it a different mental or physical preparation getting ready for those guys? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I missed the Chicago, uh, you know, robbery. Yeah. I called Indiana a little bit. Yeah. You know, people yeah. hit me on the streets every now and then. Oh, man, why y'all let uh, <laughs> uh, Reggie do I let no, no, not me. <laughs> no, I wasn't there. Not me. I wasn't on that team. I'll be Reggie two out of three times. Yeah. I own Reggie. Yeah. I own yeah. Reggie. Reggie's a cool guy. Yeah. But no, 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 not me. I wasn't on that team. The Miami, the Miami. That's what it was. The Pat Riley and the Jeff Van Gundy's. It was just a... It was it was a it was a part of it was just there. It really was there. And then once my I think Miami traded and got um, got a, a mace over there now. Yeah. So now it's the the combination of mace being there, me and Alonzo at Charlotte. Now me and Alonzo not uh, um, you know rivalries. Yeah. It was at Tim Hardaway with his mouth and his yeah. antics. Always it was just a lot, bro. Yeah. It was just a lot, man. And people don't know this when we would play in the playoffs and when we'd go to Miami. It'd be 50-50. Yeah. 50-50 oh, yeah. in that in that stadium. Yeah. And I'm and I'd always wondered why that was. And and then I you know, I think it was Mike Saunders who was like, like Larry, when anybody retired from New York, they go to Miami. <laughs> it's down south. They yeah. go to Miami. Yeah, south yeah, on these the people, it's most of these people is from New York City. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, our, our fans traveled. We was there, man. And then that would made that robbery. That's man, what made that. That has to change, man. You were suspended during the pivotal stretch in 97 series. Yeah, yeah. And also in 98. I mean, there had to be some regrets there. Like when when you needed the team needed you. How, how did you feel like when you got suspended for for those two series, both back to back years? Well, I wish you know most of the, you know I you know I do the ambassador stuff for the yeah. Knicks now, and uh, most of the time when we do even interviews or we go out, it be myself and John Starks. Mm -hmm. And don't get John started with that. You <laughs> said you don't get John started. John put this on. Um, the, the what was the uh, uh, that that ran the NBA at that time? They, not David Stern. David Stern. Yeah, 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 David yeah, Stern. Yeah, yeah. John put it on David Stern. Yeah. David, uh, bless him. Man. Yeah. But because I, I didn't see it, but you know, John know he knows the end, and I, yeah. John's a conspiracy theory guy. He said David Stern because they they should have just expend, uh, suspended our whole whoever they was on to spend one game. Right. But yeah. when they broke it up. You know, it, it really threw the chemistry off. Yeah. It really threw the chemistry. And John and I played. We played in New York. We played in New York, and Patrick didn't play in New York, and somebody else didn't play in New York, and that just really threw the chemistry yeah, off. But Alan, John, Alan got suspended. John, and Allen didn't play in New York. They played in, in Miami. And John swore that was David Sturge, so didn't want us to get to uh, Chicago. Because I believe that year we beat Chicago three out of four times, right, or four right. out of five times during the regular season. Yeah. So uh, John, oh man, they didn't want, they wanted my, they want. I'm like, John, come on, man, can't do that. He said, hey, look at it, there. look how they broke us up. Look how they broke us up. So, yeah, it was tough. It was tough. It had to I be. thought we, I thought we was pretty geared up for Chicago. But yeah. you know, you can never. The X factor is if Mike want to be great, great, great. You know, if Mike want to get 55 and double nickels, then you know it'd been, it'd been tough. But I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd like that chances with them there. Yeah, no mm -hmm. question, no question. The, the '98 squabble with Alonzo, mm -hmm. people will always remember that for Jeff hanging on, oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> on the yeah, yeah. bottom of that. Yeah, yeah. Was there a conversation with you and Jeff in the locker room after that? Like in, in the locker room after, the next day he come to the practice with a shiner. <laughs> and and, and it, I'll keep mentioning the names you mentioned. Um, I, uh, Mike Saunders was like, oh, Larry, you're going to be. But he was joking. Yeah, yeah. Mike was like, Larry, you didn't go apologize uh, to Jeff when I came in. <laughs> like, what you talking about? You popped Jeff. Right. And if you go back and you go and you look at this in slow motion, it was me that hit Jeff. What? And he <laughs> fell straight down <laughs> Alonzo Lair. I didn't know it until I watched it. I said, I didn't hit Jeff. I yeah. didn't hit Jeff. And then they showed it in slow motion. I'm like, oh, snap. Well, you know, hit Jeff in the eye. He come to practice the next day with a shot. I'm like, my bad, Jeff. My bad. He said, no, no, you get in, get in between bulls. It's what happened. I'm like, my bad, Jeff. You know what I try to hit you, bro. But yeah, we had a conversation about it. And I, I, you know how you do things, man. And then right after you go, man, I was in the locker room, my hand in my head, and my, my, my face in my hands for so long because. I just knew we was gonna get scrutinized for what went down, and 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 people gonna bring up Charlotte, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Alonzo and I had no problem in Charlotte, not not on my end, and yeah, I believe yeah. not on Alonzo's end either. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Lonzo was traded before me because of the contract, and Lonzo wanted this, Lonzo, what he's he supposed to get, because mm. Miami gave it to him, mm. but that's why he left, uh, that's why he was traded from Charlotte, and it, it couldn't have been me, because I was traded the year afterwards, you right, you know what I mean? It yeah. was like I, you know, wanted Lonzo traded or something like that the year after I was traded, so. Mm. But but when we, when you do what we did, you know, it, it, it leaves the door open for everything. And I heard some of everything. They didn't like, they didn't get together. Yeah. They couldn't get along. They couldn't play together. Man, none of that was what it was. It was just at the heat of the moment. He and I going at it right then. And yeah. I thought, you know, and and at the time, you know, Lonzo, 6'8", six, 6'9". Six, he's not a, you know, like, he played, he's a great player. And he, you know, he was agile to play center, but he wasn't like a seven footer or right. seven one center. So uh, every now and then uh, when Lonzo started, like, Doing this stuff on twin twelve feet, mm -hmm. Jeff would throw me on him, mm -hmm. or throw Buck. Where he throw a power forward mm -hmm. on him, to just get him out of that that element of his little twelve, yeah. thirteen foot thing. Because once you took Patrick away from the basket, it kind of eliminated Got Patrick out yeah. your yeah, defense. Yeah. So, yeah, I guarded Alonzo a lot that that series, and we was just balling, man. It was just two guys. We played against each other in college, mm -hmm. so it was just two guys uh, really just banging it out, man. And it, it ended up that way. In ninety nine, you you get past him in ninety nine again. And you get to that that Pacers series, and obviously the four point play it lives on in, in in Knicks fans' minds, and a legendary moment. Everybody knows where they were when that play happened. From your perspective in that series, how did it change? Did it change your mindset and the team's mindset going forward? Because it just felt like after that game, like because the Pacers were a tough matchup, but it just kind of just felt like after that moment. Like things became a little bit more clear that you guys were going to be able to advance past this team and ultimately get to the finals. Again, that was that was that fifty uh, fifty game series, little lockout fifty yeah. game series, and uh, uh, that was Spree Spree coming in. Yeah. So so we had to get Spree into the mix, and uh, Marcus into the mix, and it took us a while because that's how we ended up with eight seed. But right. we knew we wasn't an AC team. We didn't have AC talent. Mm -hmm. And nobody wanted to see us. Miami, they can talk, but they didn't want to see us. Indiana can talk, but they didn't want to see us. But we knew we was tougher than an AC. And it all came together in the playoffs. We knew, I mean, we like, hey, we're going to play 50 games together, fellas. We know what to expect of each other. Now let's just go out here and do it. And uh, my the four-point play, the four-point play was all Tom Thibodeau. Mm. Like I said, he was my shooting coach at the time. And I, I knew the ball. I, I wanted the ball, and I knew I was going to make it. I mean, and that was just confidence or just, because I wasn't really a three-point shooter. I mean, uh, I'm going to get in a spot, and, and, the, and the coach is going to put me in a spot to where I can be successful with knocking it down. Now, I'm not going to be Steph Curry coming down throwing up a three-pointer. But if I've got my feet set in the corner or feet set on, on, you know, up top, and we doubling, 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 they're coming to me, I'm going to be able to, you know, I'm, I'm an NBA basketball player. You should be able to to get to stroke that, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Shoot at least 35, 37%, something like that. Because I didn't, I didn't shoot 10, 10 three-pointers a game. But uh, I knew that was going to be an important role for me to do that because we would post Allen and we would post Spree. Mm -hmm. And those guys demand double team. So um, me and, me and uh, Thibodeau, Thibodeau knew it was going to come, man, you're going to shoot some threes this, uh, this series. <laughs> and, and I can remember the first game in Indiana, I had four points. I had four points and we lost and Jeff pulled me to the side and Thibodeau stayed in my ear to the next game. He like, yo, we're not going to win this series with you scoring four points. Mm -hmm. That was Jeff's main thing. We're not, I think he even said to the whole team, I think the next day at film, he was like, yeah. He went through the whole film session and then he go, yes. And also, with you scoring four points, I mean, Jeff put addresses on everything. We're not going <laughs> to win this series, right? I'm like, oh, snap. So me and Thibodeau went to work. We went to work and... Uh, I, like I said, it was all confidence. I knew I was going to get that shot. I think uh, uh, Marcus Camby stopped me. The, the, the play was for Allen. Mm -hmm. uh, he was number one option. Spree was number two option. But coming out of that play, uh, Marcus put me aside and said, man, you getting this ball. Mm -hmm. You getting this ball. I'm like, I hope I do. Mm -hmm. I hope I do. And it turned out that way. And just with the confidence of shooting out after practice, before practice with Tib, I just knew the ball was going in, man. I think I was three for three before that, or three wow. for four before that. So. Yeah. Yeah, it just worked out that way, man. Just pure confidence. Yeah. When when I talked about that play with Chris Childs and I, I talk I asked him about who was really the the glue of that run, he pointed to you mm -hmm. and, and talked about your vocal leadership and just really rallying those guys together. Well, where did that come from? Chris stayed in my ear. Chris stayed in my ear. Again, it was that first game when I scored 
the first game I scored four, and everybody jumped in my ear, man, it's not going to happen with you. And the next game I had 21, 22 points, and we won the next game. So I, I knew then you're going to have to play a pivotal role in, in, in us getting to where we need to get to. Because you look at that team, man, we were stacked on the wings with scores. Mm -hmm. I mean, with Sprewell and Allen, man, both can get 30 at any time. Mm -hmm. And then Chris... The Miami, Chris just, I love I love uh, Hardaway. I love Hardaway, but he had the bad knees, and Chris made him pay for it. Yeah. Chris was just running. Chris was playing 100, 100 miles an hour, and Chris stayed in my head. Them point guards, you got to love point guards. Like, man, you're going to have to knock this down for us. So it, it just came from acknowledging your role and doing your role at that time. And then Marcus and Spree being new to the team. You know, and Allen it wasn't really a vocal guy. C. Ward would talk when he need to talk. So I just took that role to do that at that point. Yeah, yeah. I felt like and maybe it was just being younger at the time, but when, especially in today's conversation around the league, we talk about dynamic duos and and and, and big three and stuff like that. I felt like Houston Spree really didn't get their due in terms of what they did with this team. They made the All Star team together as Knicks mm -hmm. in two thousand and one. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was hard to accept Spree when he came in because I was such a Starks guy. I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't know about Spree. Well, he's going to mm -hmm. mess up things. Mm -hmm. But quickly, I was like, yo, that's my guy. He's, he's the heart and soul of this team. Man. They both similar, you know, slashes on the outside. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 at that time, John may be a better three-pointer shooter than Spree, but Spree was an athletic dude and could get to the basket. So they both run two different things to, to, the, to the team. Both played uh, intensity on defense. Both was intense on defense. So I was a John man, of course. John's from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm from Dallas, Texas. We used to see each other a lot in the summer. So yeah. I was a John man. But, you know, it was the nature of, of, the, of the league or the nature of professional sports with being traded. I went through it. A lot of everybody has to go through it. So, uh, And Spree, Spree was great. When Spree came in, it was, like I said, it was no I, 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 I. Spree went through the situation in Golden State, so nobody knew what to expect. Spree was, Spree was as humble as he can be and just work, work, work. Work, work, work. He took a back seat. Spree, I mean, he wasn't starting when he first got here. I think we really went on that run when he started, when he, when, when Alan, I mean, uh, Jeff start, started Sorry. Spree. Because now teams got, now you just like got, and myself on the floor, you got Allen on the floor, you got Spree on the floor. You say big three. Now we got three guys that you got to pay attention to as far as on the offense end. Then we got Patrick Ewan over here. So, yeah, Spree was Spree did the exact thing he needed to do when he came in. He 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 kept his mouth. You know, he didn't. He wasn't in. He, he was a delight in the locker room instead of you know a problem in the locker room. What was the key to that loss to the Spurs in in the finals? Just injuries. I didn't have no business out there. I mean, Timmy, Timmy, Timmy is Timmy. I don't yeah. know. I, I I'd have did better if I was if I was healthy. Yeah, but yeah. Tim Duncan is Tim Duncan, one of the best. Uh, fundamental again, Mr. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, what's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fundamentally sound seven right. foot is you, you go you gonna get, but uh, and then Patrick didn't play that 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 series they got two seven footers, and we and I was seven footer top fifty is is on the bench with a, with a suit and tie on, so I think it was injuries. I'm I wouldn't say we would have beat San Antonio. We'd have won one more than one game, and then you get to two games and three games, then anything can happen. So. Um, I mean, again, I gotta get you get big ups, and then you got the you got one of the greatest coaches in the world over there, uh, uh, in in the history of the NBA, Popovich over there. So I don't know. It would have been a different story if Patrick was healthy and I was healthy. Yeah. As a fan, it was hard for me to see the ultimate. Ultimately, the divorce between you and, and the team, especially watching him in, in those early in Orlando uniform, in the Orlando uniform, Seattle uniform, how close they came in '94, how much he put on the line, and the, the ice bags on his knees. How did you see that as a player? Because when you came in in '96, it was kind of like the second half or the mm -hmm. tail end okay. of his next tenure, and then you ultimately saw the the separation between the two sides. How, how did you see that as a player? When it happened, I was retired. I retired before Packers. Mm -hmm. So as a, I, I looked at it as a fan, like, oh, man, look mm -hmm. at that. And, and, and you try to get in the mindset of, again, this is professional sports, but someone like he, I don't, I believe, and I, I might get in trouble, mm -hmm. but I believe uh, Patrick, um, you know, should have retired as a New York Knicks. Mm -hmm. In a New York Knicks uniform with the, you know, the wave, that, you know, wave on the court and the fans giving him his due. Uh, so I looked at it des definitely as a fan and a little disappointment. When you look at w one of the questions I have for a lot of athletes, especially when they're coming into the draft, is is your career arc. 
And and there was no bigger arc than yours because you were the number one pick. And so to have to retire early due to the injuries, mm-hmm. like how did you reflect on that when when you had finalized your career? Like you were once, you know, at the pinnacle of the sport, number one pick, and everybody's, you know, singing your praises. And then the back injury derails you and you ultimately have to leave the game. How how did that sit with you mentally? I was fine with it. I was fine with it. Um, I knew it was... I I, I first hurt my back in a a celebrity basketball game in the summer. Mm. Celebrity basketball game in the summer. A guy just kept hampering me and kept hampering me. And it was... This this game was supposed to be for Arthur Ashe, Magic Johnson, AIDS Foundation Mm -hmm. or whatever it was. But it was a total lie. It was a brother, black dude, that I just wanted to do something for him because it's a, it was a celebrity game, and I wasn't finna try to play hard, mm-hmm. right? But it was like a month. I'm from Texas, so, I, you know, we eat good. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It was like a butt after the season, and I'm 20, 25 pounds overweight, right? Hadn't did too much. And I went out there, and it was in D.C., and I found out it wasn't what he was saying it was going to be. I was the only basketball player on the t- uh, out there. It was rappers, I think, uh, uh, Bill Bellamy, Bill yeah, Bellamy yeah, yeah. things like that. I'm like, man, I'm the only basketball player out here, and I and and it was the the um, the celebrities playing against this other basketball team. Now it was a real basketball team on the other end, but they, you know, I think they was like some type of semi pro team or something like that. It was all right, and we was just it was just it was a regular game. I was just chilling. I was just chilling. And then like the last four or five minutes, I tried to play hard, mm. and being 20, 25 pounds overweight, that's when I first hurt my back. So mm. if I have you know, if I was mad about anything or regrets, I regret that. Mm. I regret that. But when I retired, when I retired, it was time. I was doing too much to play the game as far as medication. What I had to do to play the game, to be able to play the game and take the pills to play the game. No, man, you can't do this anymore. Mm. So I mentally it sets fine with me. I mean, uh, it was just for an injury and the injury happened and it's a part of the game. So I, you know, I got over it real quick. What are you most proud of when it comes to your career? Um, man, it, it humbles me so much when I hear guys from both sides, Charlotte and New York go, he was one of the best teammates I played with. When I hear uh, Jeff say he was one of the best uh, players in the locker room of, you can ever have. I'm so proud of that because, you know, talent is talent. I had it. Everybody else had it. It's the NBA. You're not getting to the NBA without talent. So... Four point plays and, and and rookie of the year. Of course, you you proud of rookie of the year. That was Muggsy Bowes. Mm. You know that was my the guys at Charlotte Hornets that was humble enough to make sure I I, I, I did that. All star all star teams. You don't make those without without uh your teammates making sacrifices for you. You know because it was, it was everybody has talent. So but when these guys when I hear he was one of the most uh best teammates I played with, that's what I'm most proud of. And today you're you're an ambassador with the Knicks. Mm-hmm. And what does that mean to you to still be with this organization? I'm, I'm sure every day you're getting love from the fans. What does that mean to you to still be with the organization today? I had my shirt on yesterday, t-shirt on <laughs> yesterday. Once a Nick, always a Nick. Yeah, yeah. Once a Nick, always a Nick. And the fans here is great. I was I was afraid of New York City when I played here. Because when I played here, everybody, we practiced in uh, Purchase. Yeah. We practiced in the Purchase, and uh, the plane took off from uh, Purchase Airport. So everybody stayed out there. I stayed out there. And, uh, man, it was like after the game, uh, oh, you want to no, know, man, I'm getting out of New York. I'm getting out of I'm scared of this New York City. <laughs> but now, man, it's one of the greatest. It, walking around, going to get something to eat, you know, going to the games, the little uh, – the uh, the games the Knicks have, the, the events they have, mm-hmm. the showcase games, and they have little events when they're on the road. It's just the, the greatest fans in the world, man, and greatest city in the world. So it means a lot. And I and I thank the organization. I thank Jim uh, for bringing me back. Dolan, he did a great he, – it was one. Of, he was really one of the most uh, pivotal guys that brought me back. Like, yo, get Larry back here. So, man, I just love it. I love it. I love my Knicks, and I love everything that's going on right now. That's what's up, man. We're we happy to have you here with the organization. Like I said, the whole Legends Land look, I thought that was a great look for the organization. It definitely was. Bringing back a lot of fan favorites. And so well, when it's all said and done, this is a question that I ask a lot of the guys, especially the first time that they come on the show. You know, when Anthony Edwards is out there Googling and doing his research and, and he Googles Larry Johnson, how do you want to be remembered? Um, team player, played hard, left it out on the floor, didn't back down from nobody or nothing. Um, never was a guy that was an eye guy and it's my turn. You know, Jeff used to say, it's my turn. Like, we come down to court, 
uh, two, three, four, five times and I hadn't had a shot. So now it's the six or seven time coming down. I, I'm in the mindset of, oh, it's my turn. Now, no, 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 no. We flowing. Let's flow. Let's flow. So just a team player, man, left it on the floor and um, uh, wasn't no easy win for nobody. All right, so now we're going to go to your questions from the people at home. Some of you guys had submitted your questions for LJ. Shout out to everybody on Twitter that did. First question, we going with our guy Ari from Manhattan, a KFTV day one. And his question is, did you actually get fouled on that four-point play? Ari, go back to Indiana, man. <laughs> go on back to Indiana. You know you're an Indiana fan. Ari, listen, um, that was the first year that Nick, the NBA come with the no hand, the no hand rule. The no hand rule. Yeah. And it, was, it, it, it worked out because if you look at that year, the first 15, 20 game, it bit me because that was my thing, you know what I mean? That was my little hand check right there. Mm -hmm. I hit you one time, then I can get you under control. Mm -hmm. Man, burp, burp. the first 15, 20 games of that, that season, I uh, was on the bench. I was like the first two fouls just like that because mm -hmm. of this. I'm like, yo, that's not a foul. Mm -hmm. And then the refs, you know, our refs talked to her, like LJ. You can't, got to get you for that. Got to get you for that. And that's what the foul was. That's what if I got it at the three-point line and gave uh, uh, Big Davis, Antonio, a good head fake and a good jab step, and he threw it out there real quick. He stopped my progress with this. So, and it was and it was continuation. Of course I got fouled. Hey, so a Antonio Davis just needs to blame Derek Harper, nobody else. <laughs> yes, yeah. Harper <laughs> really get you out of control with yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. All right, next question is from King Swift 718 Shout out to King Swift. And the question is, well, first he says, LJ is still one of my favorite Knicks acquisitions. King Swift. And his question is, who does LJ feel could somewhat resemble or embody his style of play on this current Knicks team? Well, again, I think Josh and I is about similar size. I may have him in a little, uh, maybe a half an inch or whatnot. I saw Josh the other day. So uh, I think I would have, may have had him in a little inch or so, but definitely had him in weight. I was a little 250, 255. Yeah. But the way he's playing now, I would say, you know, I love that. I love the way he's playing. Didn't really need a play, don't really need no offense, but he's going to get his on and he's going to play great defense and he's going to rebound. Well said, man. Shout out to Josh Hart. And the last question, shout out to John Cusack from Twitter. And his question is, first of all, how, how's your back feeling today? Well, I play golf two or three times a week, so I'm okay. feeling good, John. Appreciate that. Are buddy. you better than Starks? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. I'm not going to tell that lie. I, I would. I, I, I was about to get one, and he'd he jump back on your show. If yeah. I said, yeah, he'd get right back on your show. No, man. John played six, seven, ten. Yeah. John He's out there day. right now with a cigar and everything. Every day, bro. It'd be 50 degrees. John, you want to go play golf? No. It's 50 degrees. No, no. I can't get with John. The next question from John. How would your life have been different if NIL deals were allowed when you were at UNLV? Forget about it. Forget about it. That's about I love that. Good question, John. But mm. I get that a lot, man. Get that a lot. You at Vegas, number one. And uh we was we was the number one team in the in the country at that time. And we had some characters on our team. Uh Michigan uh Fab Five talk about how we did the the, uh, they were resembling us with the big shorts, the shirt tail out. Everybody had T-shirts up under their jersey. Yeah. It was just a lot there for us. It was just a lot there, man. I mean, I, these these deals, these youngsters getting big ups to you. You know, I'm not going to sit here and be a hater, but I sure think I missed out on that. Yeah. We missed out on that. And it I, it wouldn't have been any different, but, you know, you came into the league with money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you came into the league with money, so you had to – really want to just be a great basketball player. I mean, because right. if you get an idea for a million dollars, these guys get million dollars deals? Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. So you get college making million dollars, I mean, it's tough. It's tough to, to keep that fire to be like, hey, I'm already a millionaire, but you know, now you're going to the league. You're going to the NFL, the NBA. Well, I'm a millionaire. Yeah. Yeah, it's been tough. So. True story. Yeah. True story, man. Well, LJ, man, I, I got to thank you for the time. This no problem, was an incredible man. interview. No like I said, I've been I've been having this stash of this one on the list. Like, I got to get LJ on the show, man. So I definitely appreciate the time and everything you gave to, to the Knicks, man. Listen, shout out to Chuck D. Chuck, shout out to Ryan Manimal, Chuck Love D. Love you, man. Sure. Love you, boy. Absolutely, man. Mm. Larry Johnson, ladies and gentlemen, remember to like, share, and subscribe. This has been another exclusive edition of Knicks Fan TV, CP the Franchise. I'm out of here, man. Peace.